22. Acts 12, uh, 18, 12, and 22. So just to give a quick review, Paul in Acts 18 um, makes his way from Athens, Greece. He's on his second missionary journey. And he enters into Corinth and he finds Priscilla and Aquila, uh, two um, practicing Jews, one actually a native Jew, one actually a Roman. They had been kicked out of Rome because of riots that were happening in conjunction with uh, the arguments between the Jews about Christ. And Claudius, who was the emperor at the time, cleaned them out, said, you guys get out of here, you cannot come back. And so uh, Priscilla and Aquila come to Corinth and Paul meets them. They start a tent making business. <clears throat> and this is unique in that Paul spends more time here than he had anywhere before. But we saw the last time two weeks ago how, how, how God was encouraging Paul. He, he, was, he was using this as showing us that over the past 15 years, Paul's life has not been easy as he's decided to, to follow Christ. But yet we also see that it's been full of joy and it's been full of productivity for the Holy Spirit working in him, using him to build not only a church within the Jewish uh, people, but also within the Gentiles. So we saw how he encouraged them by, he encouraged him by bringing uh, Priscilla and Aquila and also Silas and Timothy come back down from Macedonia, which must have been really encouraging to him because Paul was then able to do something that he hadn't been able to do previously. Does anybody remember what that was? What he started doing as soon as Silas and Timothy came? He, he began to devote himself purely to the word of God. Yeah, and that's just such an amazing thing to be able to do. I think when we devote ourselves purely to the word of God, it's the closest that we possibly can come to being in the presence of God, like almost... It's almost a heavenly thing when we devote ourselves purely to the word. It's like when we devote ourselves purely to prayer. It's that place where heaven and earth intersects and we feel a special presence of the Lord. So I can imagine how this must have completely encouraged Paul very much too, because he wrote to the Thessalonians during this time. So he, he writes Thessalonians one and two while he's at Corinth. It's probably was one of the first rep letters that he wrote. We believe maybe Galatians could have came first, but it's it's up for grabs. Most theologians think uh, Thessalonians or Galatians. And so he completely dedicates himself to the word. The spirit moves him and he starts to write scriptures. Then he gets more encouragement by being um, in a synagogue, uh, basically getting kicked out. But yet the synagogue leader ends up converting to Christ. So they go to this house across the street from the synagogue. The synagogue leader, Crispus, begins to believe in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and were being baptized. And when you see that word being baptized, not only do you think about that personal profession of faith that these people were making, but baptism also has the, the, the idea that they are now showing that their identity and their belonging is now with the community. So they're, they're publicly saying, I'm a Christian. I'm identifying with this group of, of this group of people, which can be at this time and in many areas of the world now very dangerous, as we know. So after all this happened, the Lord finally, <clears throat> the chief encourager comes to Paul and says, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and don't be silent for I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. I love that. But you'll get attacked but not in order to harm. For I have many people in this city. And so Paul, receiving all this encouragement, says, you know what? I'm going to stay here for some time. So he stays in Corinth for another year and a half, and he teaches the word of God, immerses himself in the word, <clears throat> writes the uh, first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. And if you ever, get a, you ever want to get a glimpse of maybe what Paul was going through at this time, read those books in light of, read actually all the, the epistles, Philip, the, the, the book of the Philippians, Galatians, and all that, or you could follow through them right through the book of Acts and sort of get another, another angle from it. <clears throat> but in our text tonight, we have a different, sort of a different shift. Every time you read something in the scriptures, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, well, why is the Holy Spirit telling us this? That's the first thing we want to say. Why is the Holy Spirit 
Why did he put this section of scripture here? Every single word of God, every single thought and word of God has weight. Nothing goes to waste. Every jot, every tittle will be fulfilled. Every word that comes out of his mouth will not return void. So any, every word we see in the scriptures is something significant, something to do with our redemption, something to do with what God is trying to show us. So you always want to say, what is God telling us in this text? But we also want to say, is what is the author trying to tell us in this text? Why, as a human being, did this person write this and what the people that he was writing to the situation that was going on around him what provoked him to do this but more importantly more importantly than everything where does this passage that he wrote fit in the big purpose that he has for the book and so the person who wrote the book of acts is, is obviously luke uh, as we've talked about many times luke also wrote uh, his the, the third gospel, the third synoptic gospel, the gospel according to Luke. Luke was a physician. He was very, very much a, uh, a brilliant type of guy. He had um, a, 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 a uh, very pure writing style, a very unique writing style, and he was a very, very good storyteller. So we have to ask ourselves, what is he doing by putting in this chunk of scripture here from chapter from verses 12 to verses 22? mostly chapter or verses 12 to 17, he says, so he goes, he tells us that Paul's teaching for a year and a half in Corinth, after God said, I'm going to protect you. No one's going to harm you. And then he says, but while Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, now proconsul means he was the governor of that province. So Rome basically took over the world. And what they would do is they would go and Romanize different provinces. Okay, that's why Paul is always using, he's always talking about to, to people in this, in his epistles about citizenship. Like your citizenship isn't here, it's in heaven. But he's not saying that you, he wants you to go to heaven to live. He's saying, no, we want to bring heaven here. We want to bring heaven here on earth. And Paul, and that's exactly what the Romans wanted to do by setting up these provinces. They said, we want to bring Rome to this area. We want to Romanize Philippi. We want to Romanize Corinth. And so they would put, they would have several different colonies, and then they would put over all of those a, a leader, okay? And Gallio was the leader. He was the proconsul of uh, Achaia. And the Jews at this time, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now, Gallio was a very uh, famous guy. We know he, uh, from secular writing that he started as a proconsul around July of 51. So this is a really incredible um, piece of archaeological evidence for biblical interpreters because this could be a baseline for Paul's, a lot of other things to connect the dots in, in terms of Paul's timeline. So we know this is around AD 51, which tells us a lot about what, what Paul was doing and when he was doing it. This Achaia was uh, the most important region of Roman Greece. And Gallio was actually the younger brother of the famous philosopher Seneca. I don't know if you've ever studied philosophy, but he was a, uh, a very well-known philosopher at the time. And he was also the tutor to Nero, who was to come about 10, 15 years later. And so um, Gallio was a really important guy. And basically what he would do is he would judge they had an elevated center at the city's uh, public space or what they call the Agora, and they would bring in, it's still there to this day, there would be sort of like a, an elevated pulpit where Gallio would stand and he would hear from the, from the magistrates or hear, he would hear cases and he would make judgments. So this is where they brought Paul to this elevated center and sort of laid him out there. And basically <clears throat> they brought him before the judgment seat and they said, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, remember what Jesus said to Paul. He said, don't be silent. He says, go on speaking. For I have many people in the city. They're not going to attack you to harm you. So this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Paul's about to defend himself. And what happens when he was about to open his mouth? 
Gallio said to the Jews, he stops them right in his place, he interrupts them. If it were a matter of wrong or of a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words, names, and your own law, look at it after for yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge in these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue at that time, and they began beating him in front of all the, all the people at the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Now, Paul, verse 18, having remained many days longer, he took leave of the brethren and he put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. And in Centria, he had his hair cut for his keeping a vow. And they came to Ephesus and he left them there. And he himself, before he left, he entered the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. Ephesus was a very popular place for the Jews. Lots of synagogues, lots of Jews there. But he knew he had Priscilla and Aquila there. He asked them to stay. And uh, when they asked Paul to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. Um, but he took leave of them and he said, I'll return again to you if God wills. And then he left and went set sail from Ephesus. And he, he went all the way back to the mainland. Uh, where he landed at Caesarea, and he went up and greeted the church. When you ever see you see them saying he went up, that means he went up to Jerusalem. He went up to the to the mount, and he greeted the church. But then he went back down to Antioch to the church there. And so, and then in verse twenty three, we have Paul's start of his third missionary journey. But what I want to talk about today is this whole issue with Gallio, and why did Luke put this in here? What is God, I believe, what is, what is God trying to show us by putting this sort of seems like an insignificant sort of detail? Because nothing really happened um, to Paul. I mean, we saw that there was an argument. We saw that Sosthenes actually got, wasn't too good for him. But Paul was being accused, as usual, as somebody that was worshiping God contrary to the law. What was God doing? And really, what does God do throughout the whole book of Acts? Well, I believe one of the main, one of the several things that we could pull out of here is that Jesus is showing us that his church grows through persecution, through not just opposition, not just criticism, but through specific uh, uh, persecution, what I like to call victorious persecution. And we also see that as Paul did, we must do the same thing, and that is during the threat of persecution during the threat of opposition we must remember the words of jesus and trust and trust the lord so <clears throat> we basically know why paul did, why paul was brought in front of gallio it was basically to intimidate paul to to get him in trouble the jews have been sort of chasing him around as soon as he comes into a place here come the jews to knock him out but one of the reasons I believe Paul was brought in front of Gallio here was because Luke, who was the author of the Gospel of Luke, wrote in chapter 21, verses 12 to 13, saying, Jesus saying, but before all these things, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Before all these things happen, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and turn you over to the synagogues and prisons. And they will bring you before kings and governors on account of my name. And it will lead for an opportunity for your testimony. So here we see Luke having us he look back to what he wrote before. Luke wanted us to see that this is being used not only for this victorious persecution, but also because Jesus had prophesied it. But yet, in fact, it would be a victory, it would be an opportunity for testimony. Practically, the Jews were afraid that they would be categorized as those who worship another king. You see, back in the, during this transitional time from when Jesus died until the Jews, till AD 70, when the Jews, their land was wiped out, their temple was wiped out, all that, there was, it was a very tumultuous time in the church because there was, there was almost a split. There was almost a Jewish church and a Christian church. And Paul's, all Paul's writings are to keep this unity. There's one spirit. There's one baptism. There's one faith. There's one identity marker now. It's not the Torah. 
It's faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we have to do to become, quote unquote, righteous before God. But what was going on was, was because the, the Christians thought so much like the Jews and because they still were monotheistic, one God, they believed in one God, the Romans looked at the Christians and basically included them as one. And that's why you see Gallio here going, look, I'm not going to get involved. You know, you're talking about all these things, these questions about words, names, and your own law. This is basically giving the structure of what Paul was talking about the Old Testament. He was talking about things of Judaism. So they looked at as the same, but the Jews didn't want that because they were saying that the Messiah was already come and risen and is enthroned as king now. And so the Jews were saying, get that out of here, because if the Romans hear that, there goes everything. You see, because the Romans had to deal with the Jews. They said, look, you guys keep cool. We'll allow you to worship your God and you won't have to bow down to our gods. So the Christians sort of snuck under this covering, which was good in the beginning. But the Jews were infuriated at that because that was going to ruin what they had intended, which was uh, to continue to stay focused until God sends a military victory or until they collude with Rome so much that they're able to do what they want to do. So <clears throat> Claudius had already expelled Jews from Rome, so that it was a very tense time for them. He didn't want to cause more issues as well. See, Gall Gallio, if he had said, yes, they're wrong, as soon as he had said that, that the Christians are now a, a, uh, you know, a sect that's going out and worshiping another king, that would have went out and spread to all the provinces of Rome. Because if, if one, it would be like if one governor in one state in the union made a law, then every governor in every state of the union had followed. That's what it was in Rome. So as soon as they, Gallio would have made a judgment either way, it would have caused havoc. Because as soon as that happened, the Jews would have ran out and told everybody, and Christians would have become persecuted. <clears throat> and who knows what would have happened uh, as it relates to the church. So he didn't want to be the one responsible for causing more issues by condemning Paul in either direction. But Luke shows us here that they beat this synagogue leader. They beat Sosthenes. Now, we don't know who Sosthenes necessarily was. He could have been one of three people. He could have been either <clears throat> a newly a new unconverted synagogue leader, because we know Crispus left the synagogue and became a believer. So Sosthenes could have been the new Jewish synagogue leader, and he could have brought everybody to the to, to he could have grabbed all rallied up the jews and they brought i mean this wasn't no small gathering this was the whole city gathering because this was an exciting thing you know they didn't have tv and stuff then this was what the entertainment was let's see what Gallio's going to do is he going to bring the hand down and so all the people were there and Gallio doesn't do anything and what do they do they start to riot and they start to beat this guy because the jews were an annoyance to the romans so basically, you brought us here, and nothing happened, so we're going to give it to you. That, that's one option. Um, <clears throat> the second option is that Sosthenes was the newly converted synagogue leader. Maybe he was a Christian, because in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul mentions that he's writing this letter with Sosthenes by his side. Could it be the same one? It was a popular name? We don't know. But he could have been. He could have been the same one. Or it could have been Sosthenes as the Jewish leader who then got converted later and now is with Paul. But why Luke, but, but why Luke is showing us here, what does he say? He says, God, Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. You see, Luke wanted us to know that this wasn't a, the Romans endorsing Christianity. These guys were still the ruler. They were still the, in, the, in the hand of the enemy being used against Christians. They're the ones that crucified Jesus. So Luke wants us to know here that they were by no means palling up <clears throat> to do this. So how did Jesus use this as a victorious persecution? Well, number one, <clears throat> this whole incident that happened, some uh, historians and, and commentators say that if this incident had went the other way and, and th this, um, this Gallio would have said ruled against 
Paul and said, no, yes, he is guilty. He's causing up. It could have probably set back the gospel 10 to 15 years from going forward. The, the church would have been completely shut down because Rome would have literally, who that's they were the gateway to the whole world. Now think about that. You're in AD 51. AD 70, everything's done. All the letters of the, of the, of the New Testament were written at that time. So this would have been a very big impact if that had happened. But God, of course, sovereignly um, goes in and, and says this and says, basically, no, this isn't going to happen. And also by using Gallio, the pagan ruler, to confirm that Paul was a Jew and not a proclaimer of a foreign religion gave Christians much more freedom. That's why I believe Paul stayed there many more days. Because now it was just like, wow, the doors are open. It's like, cool. We can go. We can go free. We can take our masks off now. You know, we're, let's stay for a while. You know what I mean? So basically, that, that's he's saying that, you know, this, this well, there's, a little, there's a little bit of a nuance on one of the words that he uses here. He, he basically says, he uses, Luke uses the word in the Greek for wrong or uh, it's basically right here. It says, if when Gallio says, if it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, that word wrong in the Greek alludes and has, has, a, uh, has colors of morally wrong, religiously wrong. And basically what, what he was saying or evil, he was implying that Paul was pure from a Torah perspective. In other words, Gallio looked at this and said, he's not going way off of what you guys believe. I don't know everything about it, but it seems pretty legitimate to me. And see, Paul's, if Luke verifies that Paul's working within this Jewish framework because he says in verse 15, questions about teaching persons, own law, yourselves. These are all words that speak of the law, obviously, persons, Jesus, questions about teaching, salvation. So Paul was using was was being a Jew in this situation he was not going off the writers wanted people to know that Paul wasn't starting a new religion the Jewish religion Israel was like a body a torso without a head and Paul was putting the head on that torso and completing the story of Israel he wasn't making a new torso he wasn't trying to create something new and that was very, very important. So God is showing us here, teaching us a biblical principle that God uses all things. He uses all sorts of people, even pagan rulers, to accomplish his will. You could think back throughout the whole Jewish history. We think back of Egypt. God used Pharaoh. He hardened his heart in order to save his people. Excuse me. He used the Assyrians, the vicious army from the north who came down and took over northern Israel. He used them and called them, brought them in. He used the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And here he is still continuing to use civil rulers in order to, and pagan at that, to use and to, uh, to accomplish as well. So we see this victorious persecution from a perspective of Gallio. And now we, I want to talk real quick about Paul's response. Why do you think <clears throat> that Paul took a vow? Did you, ever, did, you ever, did you notice that? And he says that he was having remained many days longer. He took leave of the brethren and he put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. And in Centria, he had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow. Anybody know why? I remember when my son Ezra was born. Well, when, he, when I found out he was pregnant, my wife was pregnant with, with him. Um, my wife and I had children older, so, you know, you get all the scares of every one of our children. Like they're trying, you know, they scare you with all the ultrasounds and pictures and the measurements. And so by number four, you know, I was like, so I just went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I am going to, I've never done this before, but I'm going to make a vow that please bring forth this child in health. And I'm not going to shave until he's born. <laughs> So I'm not, this is just my, this is just an example of a vow. And so I did, and I can show you some of the pictures. It was crazy. I didn't even trim it. That was before beard butter or beard butter and brushes. It was, I, I had a big old bush like this big when my, in, the, in the hospital. The day that my wife was born, I had videos of it. I'll show you guys one day. And then on the way home, I, I, I went to go pick them up. I have other videos of it all shaved down. 
So why do you think Paul did this? Does anybody have any idea, maybe from the story or anything that you want to, that anybody want to try to take a guess? I believe that when Jesus spoke to Paul, there's two things. I believe that when, it could have been actually three things. Paul begins devoting himself to the word, right? Now the, now the vow is not to cut your hair. The vow is to not cut your hair. It was called a Nazarite vow. There were different variations of it. There was a pure Nazarite vow, which you never cut your hair your whole life. Couldn't even brush your hair. Because if a, if a brush came through your hair, your hair could fall out. So Samson, when he took a Nazarite vow, he never even brushed his hair. Imagine how thick, you know, it was. And uh, who, who knows what was in that, right? I don't even, can't even imagine it. But there was other Nazarite vows as well, too, where you could take a 30-day Nazarite vow or a year Nazarite vow, and you don't cut your hair. So I believe Paul was so passionate when he began devoting himself to the word of God that maybe he took a vow to the Lord and said, God, Will you, will you be with me in this place, in this special place, in a special way? And then maybe God came to him and said, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. And maybe that was uh, something as well that encouraged him. It could have been that that started. It. God, God just spoke to me and said, don't just keep on going. And maybe he decided at that point, or maybe he decided after Gallio, uh, beat up Sosthenes right in front of him, and he, he thought back to the promise of God that he wouldn't be touched. In this specific circumstance, maybe he took a vow and said, I'm not going to cut my hair until I leave. And so that's, that's all practically what could happen. But one of the things that I believe Paul and Luke is trying to show us here in combination with the words of Galio and in combination with the accusation that we see in this is that Paul was still being an Israelite. He was still being a Jew. He was still following the God of the Old Testament. He wasn't forsaking that God. He, Luke wanted us to see here another layer under that is that the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, completes and, and fulfills his promises to deliver his people. And so he's showing us under this a top level victorious promise through persecution and this underneath promise that we see illustrated in Paul saying faithful again to the trueness of who he is uh, to his allegiances to and that is Yahweh of the Old Testament and he is this is showing us that this is Jesus Christ he's showing us as well too that Paul is getting accused just as Jesus did um, you remember Jesus would with, with all the accusations that were made about him the false accusations were, you are teaching stuff that's contrary to our law. We believe that this is supposed to happen a completely different way. The stuff you're saying is not making sense. It's not driving with us. And that isn't happening. So Paul is a little bit different. When, when anytime you see the Jews saying, you're telling us to worship God, contrary to the Torah. Remember, in the word, in the scriptures, when you see the word law, it's not what we get programmed and think 10 commandments, 10 commandments, 10 commandments. It's Torah. It's the Torah. Because the Torah was the all the Old Testament law. Everything that identified Jewish people as the people of God. Okay, so it was a big thing. Because the people of God was the holiest space in all of the world. Even though they were defiled, the law of God, the temple of God, all of that was there. And that's what God sent forth to attract sin to that law. Because remember Paul said, where the transgression is, the sin gets multiplied. Why? Because that's the holiest place of all. And then God sends his son in to take it and bear that sin of the law. And he gets sin at all in once. He lures it in. If you read in Romans 7, it's like a magnet. He gets the trespass to expand and to, and to literally run to it. You know, I think of like um, of, of like the movies like Star Wars or the, the trope of, okay, we have to go to the enemy ship and shut off the shields. And once we do that, we'll, all the shields from all over the world will drop and we'll attack, right? Well, imagine all the shields all over the world. Those are, the enemy had shields all over the world. The gospel, Jesus, God could not go forth in, in the world. 
because sin had its power over the earth, over all of creation because of Adam's transgression. Sin dominated. And so God creates this people. He creates the law. And that sin had not, if he, Paul says, if I didn't know, if I didn't know what, it, when I knew what it was to covet, sin came and caused all sorts of lusts inside of me, right? Well, that's a small microcosm of what happened. When the law came, it attracted that sin. It magnified sin. It showed sin for the sinfulness of really what it was. But then Jesus at the cross dies at the cross and he shuts the shields down. All the power of sin is useless. Now, the enemy's still there, right? When the shields drop, that doesn't mean that we still, we still have to fight. Okay, but instead of the shields going out to the enemy, we now get the shield of the spirit and the blood of Christ. And so now we're able, as long as we walk in the spirit, we are now able to defeat the things of the flesh. When we give in to sin, and we're giving in to an idol, we're giving in to, we're taking the authority and power that should belong to us, and we're giving it over to this thing that we're worshiping. And that's how sin consumes us. So when we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so what Paul was saying when he says that he was speaking contrary to the law, they wanted to stay in that one little lane with the law. But Paul's saying, no, no, wait a second. That's been defeated. You don't need to be circumcised anymore to be, uh, to be a, a true person of Israel. You don't need to follow all these ceremonies anymore. It's all been fulfilled in Jesus. Why? Because sin has been dealt with. It's no longer needed. It's like the scaffolding over a building. The building is there. Take the scaffolding down. You don't need it. It's part of the building does everything the scaffolding was doing before. Doesn't discount the importance of it. The law was holy. The law was great, but it could not take away sin. It actually did the opposite. It drew sin to one place so that God can come and be the faithful Israelite and take that on himself and destroy it. So when, when you, every time you see Paul talking about it's contrary to the law. It's typically in the, in the sense of these the circumcision and eating with Gentiles. So Paul is sitting there. He'd go into a synagogue and go, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. And everybody go, oh, right, that's great. And it's for the Gentiles too. Oh, get out of here. You can't do that. No, it's for everybody. No, get out of here. We don't want to hear that. No, seriously, we can eat with them. We're one. No, I don't want to get out of here. And, and then they uprise and then they pull. He's talking about a new God, a different God. But Paul's saying, no, Paul's saying Jesus fulfilled the law in Christ. Circumcision is fulfilled in Christ. The unity is now where all the walls are broken down. So this is a very, I think God is showing us in a very specific way, a bigger picture of in Gallio's response and Paul's response. And we also see here, too, that we have Paul keeping this vow. One of the, you know, incidentally, one of the things about a Nazarite vow was it had to be in Jerusalem. So if you were to take a Nazarite vow and you were going to grow your hair for 30 days and keep a vow to the Lord and seek the Lord for whatever it is you're seeking him for, you had to go in Jerusalem and do that and then cut your hair and offer it onto the altar at the end of your vow. But they did, in the Mishnah, they did have a little bit of a, um, I guess, a uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of, a clause in there that could say, if you're outside Jerusalem, you can have the vow as long as within a certain period of time, you come to Jerusalem and you go in and worship at the temple. So that's why I believe Paul said, Paul was here. He had to keep his vow. He came to Ephesus. He entered the synagogue. He reasoned. They asked him to stay. Imagine that. Please, Paul, stay. He goes, no, I got to get out of here. I can only imagine that it's because he was being faithful to what he believed was right for the Lord. Now, this isn't saying that Paul thought it was that we had to still follow the law. And the reason why we have that skewed mindset is because, in, especially in, in Western Christianity, we've been programmed for this works-based relationship with God, where it's, it's all about works or it's all about grace. And if you can't, and there's no mixture of the two. We, we learned about in the, in the documentary the other day that works are a result of our response from grace, okay? 
But one of the miscues on the on, on I believe in looking at the Jewish people was that all they were trying to do was work their way to God. And that's what the law was about. Let me just do my good works and get on God's good side and work my way, work my way, work. That's not what was going on. There was, of course, an element of that, but it was more in their pride and their identity as being the people of God and being the ones that are the holiest place on earth. So Paul, when he wants to be a Jew, it's okay. You saw in the Jerusalem Council in, in the 15th chapter of Acts, they didn't say, they didn't tell the Jews that they had to stop going to the temple, stop going to synagogue, and stop doing all the things they wanted to do. They just said the Gentiles can't, they can't be imposed on the Gentiles. Got that? But knowing that, Paul, knowing that in 20 years, it's all going to be wiped out, he basically didn't, it didn't matter so much in the big, in the big picture. In AD 70, the temple and the whole entire Jewish land and everything was wiped out. So there was no more temple worship. There was no more ceremonial law. That's when they started to make up all these other substitutes to do outside of Jerusalem, to do here in the American America, and all that's where all the roots come from. But I think it's very important to see, and, and I guess the lesson that we really want to learn from this is that, that when we read the scriptures, we have to have the backdrop of Israel there to fully understand them. We have to read the scriptures in context. And when we do that, God's word blows up in front of us. And not only do we see the depth and magnitude of God's word, but we see the depth and the magnitude of the faithfulness and fulfillment of God and his promises. That this book is one book, one message. It's not two different messages. It's one message. So what can we learn from this? Some more things. Well, obviously, Jesus always keeps his promises to build his church. Again, this promise to Paul, I'm going to be with you. I have people in the city, including a pagan named Gallio, and I am going to make him do what I want him to do. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I believe he also wants us to show us here that although Paul, he was protected very specifically in this situation, Paul suffered many more tribulations and persecution after this. A Christian life following the Lord and trying to build for his church and his kingdom is not an easy life. We have to be ready to speak and not be silent regardless of the situation. Jesus gives us times of trial and times of refreshing, as we see here in Paul. And we have to stay faithful and keep our vows to the Lord, as Paul did. The more the enemies of God resist, the faster the church grows. It's a crazy little thing. Little does Galileo know that Christianity will be the national religion of the empire in a few hundred years. Jesus wants us to expect persecution and to delight in them. He says to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10, my grace is sufficient for you. Again, talking to the people that were here during this time. My grace is sufficient for you and my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses. I delight, I'm adding that for effect, in insults. I delight in distresses. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties on behalf of Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. If we could just get that and see that when those shields came down and sin was defeated and we get the shield of faith and we get the shield of the spirit, the battle still needs to be won. It still needs to be implemented. And when we walk in the spirit, we're going to be, we're going to be completely defended. But as soon as we get out of that and we go off, we end up, end up going after that that idolatry, that sin, and that, that then becomes the ruler over us instead of God. Second Timothy, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I don't know how this <clears throat> lines up with what we're going through right now in our country, but I have to tell you that I am concerned about our nation right now, especially as from a Christian perspective. Um, you know, every, the, when you, when you sort of, you know, 
when you're driving around and in, in around in October and November, you see all the Thanksgiving decorations. It's one of my favorite times of year, Thanksgiving. I get excited because I love Thanksgiving. But then right after Thanksgiving, on Black Friday, immediately you start seeing what? The Christmas decorations. And everywhere you go, you start hearing the Christmas song. You start seeing the Christmas billboard. Everything's this. The spirit of the, of the starts to change. People start, you can start to feel it, right? I sort of have that feeling now about the coming persecution that I believe we're going to have in America. It's not quite here, quite yet, but you see the decorations, the smell is in the air, you see the billboards, it's no longer Thanksgiving, it's now something else. I mean, some of the things I'll, I'll just mention, Antifa, um, I don't know much about them, but they're, they're, they're pretty scary and from what I can concern from a Christian perspective. The purposes of this is Antifa is from anti-fascism, and it's basically um, a war against far-right activists. Anybody who looks at, um, I would say, the nation as something that's important as a community, they look at that as fascism, like the biological aspect, the cultural aspect, the historical aspect. You look at that and you take pride in that, that is, is in lieu of fascism. Um, they shut down groups that they feel are fascist. And if they believe that you're a right-wing activist, which they believe evangelicals are, you're considered far right by the far left. You may not be considered far right by the medium left. Maybe some of you are left right. I'm not about that. I'm just saying that this type of group, now I see some of the things that have been happening all over the, all over the country, little by little by little, Cancel culture is another thing. When it thrusts people out of, out of social circles, out of professional circles, if, if what they say are deemed to be acted or spoken in a questionable or controversial manner, it doesn't go, you're canceled, you're done. And of course, this Equality Act, which was recently passed in the House and has now moved to the Senate. I don't know if you know what this is. The Equality Act is um, to amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Now, it's not just in employment, but it's in all public accommodations, education, federally, federally funded programs, housing, and 80, listen to this, 83% of Americans support it, 16% only don't. More than 547 national and state local organizations support it. 379 major companies support it, like big ones, Apple, Google, Netflix, and many church denominations do. But the thing about this may be saying, oh, wow, this is not going like, to, we, we don't want people to be discriminated against. We definitely don't want that. But what they're doing is because they're slipping in the gender aspect in there, it provides zero protection for freedom of speech and for religious organizations. So anything spoken against the LGBT movement or lifestyle in a church will be considered and could be considered discrimination. So these things start to start to scare me. Yeah, even, even though that counters biblical, I mean the, the whole center of Christianity that counteracts that. And, and, and how can I, I don't know? I guess how can that be even possible? Well, it, it's it, it's possible. It's, but beyond that, practically. You have First Amendment, right. which which you can't form any law against a religion right. or any type of religious institution, and you have freedom of speech. So it does. Come, that's what the big problem is. It's right. an it's it's a confusion. It's a collusion there that's going to create confusion. Now, am I trying to rally up people and say Antifa and cancel culture? But no, I'm just trying to show you that the end result of all these roads is going to be targeting biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is going to be targeted, not the liberal churches, not the churches that don't believe the Bible is the word of God, that don't believe that man and woman are the only valid uh, form of matrimony, not that, you know, all the aspects of all the ones that think homosexuality is okay, abortion is okay, all these big hot buttons, this is where it's going to come down to. So how do we deal with this now? How do we do it? We start to prepare now. We don't go out and start picking fights. But we have to be ready, and the Bible shows us right here that, yes, God will be with us. 
but we cannot back down and we cannot run from these situations. We have to put the stake in the ground for Christ in love. And Jesus wants us, obviously, to keep our eyes on, the, on, on him and on the cross. See, Jesus often takes the problem, and I believe he's going to do this with, with the things I just talked about, and he turns it around into a solution, right? Objections. Take the reason they're not buying and turn it into the reason they should buy, right? Legitimately, of course. Of course. <laughs> Got to be careful there. So he turns these things around. And this is why I believe we need as a, as a church to pray for revival. Revival means the hearts of people are turned more to God. Their personal lives become more pure and holy because of the spirit of God, not to outwardly do it. We have to pray for revival in this nation and technically in the whole, in the world. That's just, it's not just America that's, that's having this. But we see in this picture that Jesus wants us to look at the cross. And I don't know, can you see the cross in this story? The cross in the story is here. We take something where the enemy thinks he's going to defeat Christians and defeat God and defeat Jesus, and it turns around and ends up promoting it. Paul gets dragged before the proconsul. We want to get rid of this guy. And what happens? It clears the road for the church for the next 10 years at least, because that's when Nero came in and, and started persecuting Christians severely. But it got the scriptures out. God's will was done. So this is exactly what I hope and I pray for every day, is that when we are put to the test, not that we're going out there to purposely ruffle feathers, not that we're going out there to, to hate on people, because Lord knows we don't want to do that. We want to love. We want to be a beacon of love. We want to be a beacon of hope. We want to promote the gospel. But I'm telling you, and I'm not being prophetic here. I'm just being uh, somebody that's giving you wise counsel. There is going to come a day where people are going to, and they may be right out here with picket signs or whatever, or they may put a fence outside here saying, this is a hateful place. God was in there last week. They were teaching on 1 Corinthians 6, 9. They were teaching on Romans 1. And they were saying homosexuality is a sin, and this is discrimination, and what's going to happen? No, no. Maybe they'll just take away our nonprofit status, but I'm at it. Maybe they'll just say, you know what, um, you're going to have a black eye. I don't know, but I think it's going to be worse than that. That's my opinion. And I just want to encourage that, that from this scripture, we need to be able, we need to prepare now to be strong in our faith and strong in, in, as it relates to what we believe. So, with that said, any questions? <laughs> Rod, do you have a question? Yeah, I guess, I guess the yeah. main question is, and it's a struggle, um, yeah. you know, to, to walk in, in, like Christ in, in Christianity, and, and then sometimes, you know, you're, you're faced with the news. Or, so, I try to block the news out. You know, I try, try to invest, because I don't have the ability to do anything about it. And it really was weighing on my, my heart. Every time I turn it on, I can't believe I'm hearing a lie. I'm, 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 there's more rights being taken away and it's, it, it starts to tug at you. So I guess my, my question is, and then you start not wanting to, you start with, with you start looking at people as if they're the ones you got to look out for. They're, they're the, you're almost looking like the enemy. It almost feels like it's an assault on Christianity itself. I mean, yeah. it, that's, that, that's the way the media, it, it feels. So I guess my question is, how how do we prepare, and what is what is the right way to prepare? I mean, we're, am I preparing to stand up and fight? Is that the right way? I'm not saying physically fight, yeah, but but stand up to the pushback of that, or how, to strengthen myself to be able to give love because that's that's what I find the most difficult, no matter how hard I try, is just the love, you know, yeah, you know, the, the, your your enemy or whatever whatever it may be. It's, it's, it's sometimes difficult because you don't even realize sometimes you're walking down the street and all of a sudden somebody's looking at you like you're the enemy all yeah. of a sudden. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. so, so I, I guess what's the proper walk? Right. That's a great question. So first of all, Sunday, we're going to be uh, the theme of Sunday's sermon is loving your enemies. So we're going to talk a lot about that then. So I don't want to give that sermon away right now. But uh, um, the first thing we have to do is realize that the most 
the, the man's biggest dilemma and what's under every one of these things is sin. It's sin. And every one of us has that same streak of sin running through us, regardless of whether you're left, right, middle, whatever. We are all in that sinning. We all are sinners before the Lord. But God has given us the grace and the, and the ability to know him. So the first thing we have to do is understand that this Antifa and, and cancel culture and the Equality Act and whatever other things you want to bring up, the underlying problems with them, although some of the things in those things are good, let's say, maybe intention-wise from the people that are doing it, I'm not judging their intentions. Maybe they're passionate, maybe they do care, whatever. But the underlying sin there is not being opened up to the word of God and the gospel to see the truth. So we have to acknowledge that first. And then we have to not run from the confrontation. Right. We have to go confront in love with the word of God. So we have to deal with it ourselves in our heart, because a lot of times we do want to respond in, in anger, you know, right. and, and it's like, so we want to, we want to be able to have discussions about these things with people and show them our worldview and show them and know that we can do something about it because we can just affect one person. We can affect our families to begin with, our church family, our regular families, the people that have worked, the people by standing up for Christ, not by being a, a mouth and going, oh, that's, you know, you guys are, you know, wrong and all this other stuff. Invite in the conversation. We're no different than they are, whoever, wherever side you're on. We're all sinners. God has opened up our eyes. We're called to love. We're called to present the truth. We're not called to fall down before the wicked. That's not, God says the righteous man that falls down before the wicked is like a polluted fountain. It's like a cesspool, okay? We got to stand up, but at the same time, it's got to be in love. And so that's a sanctification thing for all of us. We all do that because God has given us that inborn sense of justice. We want to right wrongs, but it's God. The Bible says, don't take vengeance on anybody yourself. Don't try to repay evil with evil. We got to be careful that we don't do that. But we do have to be able to take a stand and we do have to be non-compromising. We can't, we can't compromise on what we know to be in this book right here. We cannot do that. So I hope that helps. Implied in all that is reading and learning the scriptures so you know what the truth is. Yes, yeah, staying in the word and studying the word and being in prayer, being walking in the spirit, walking in, you know, in walking in the in, in the footsteps of the Lord having him be with you, and it's a daily death that you have to take. That's what this, that's what we're on a journey of death, all of us. And it's not a journey of physical death necessarily. I'm saying it's a daily journey of dying to our flesh, dying to ourself, and saying, I'm not going to give myself over to this idol, this idol of sex, this idol of lust, this idol of withdrawal, whatever, whatever the idol is, as soon as we give ourselves over to it, we become chained to it. And you're my authority now, dragging me around, right? And that's why when we're dealing with these issues, we have to make sure we're dealing with it from a biblical perspective. Otherwise, we're just going to be doing the same thing, but from a different perspective, right? Any other questions? Just a prayer for someone who wants to pray. Oh, yeah. That, um, got a prayer request, Jake? Yeah. Um, it's one, my, my friend's mom 